I'll first ask if, if everyone can hear me just okay. Even in the back, guys? Good. Uh, the, the, the title of this uh, course is uh, Hidden Art of Testing Software. And that's because uh, pretty much everyone believes that they can test software. But uh, many of these people I've met actually don't know how much they are missing. And they don't know because nobody has ever told them. They are doing the best they can, but without even knowing where you can go, you can hardly go there on your own. So the purpose of this presentation isn't to teach you some uh, specific advanced techniques, but more to raise awareness of they are, so you can decide for your own if you like them or not. A uh, few words to the beginning. Uh, some of the things I will say might uh, suspiciously resemble kicking into holy cows. Uh, let me assure you that I don't intend to uh, be evil to anyone's preferred methods. However, I do believe that to make informed decisions, people must know both positives and negatives, because otherwise their, their viewpoint on which things should be used for which uh, specifics could be slightly distorted. So, you know the best what quality assurance things work for you and your project. If you are firmly believing that your quality is as good as it can get, feel free to take the blue pill, just enjoy the wonderful food and sleep through the rest of the presentation. But if you think you can go deeper, learn some advanced skills or e even consider them, then the follow me, take the red pill and I'll try to show you just how deep the advanced QA stuff goes. Since the lesson's title is Hidden Art of Software QA, let's start with the, with the first uh, secret, which is hardly secret, but still, some may not know it, so it's good to uh, refresh it in the beginning. Some say that you can test software fully, that if there is a bug in the software, it means that you didn't test enough. Well, the simple problem is that if you have even a relatively simple program, which has just 70 branches, with uh, two choices, that means 70 independent if statements. To achieve 100 uh, path coverage, it means examine or test every code path it could possibly get, every combination of them. It would uh, take two on the 15th, uh, on the 17th power. And uh, that's sextillions. That's about the same number of test cases as there are estimated the grains of sand on the planet Earth. And if you wanted to test these things brute force, and it took your test program 30 seconds to execute each of these tests, it would take approximately the same time as uh, 82,000 times the estimated age of our universe. For complex programs like the Solaris operating system, trying all combinations is even more impossible. It would take more tests than there are atoms in observable universe. So that, yeah, it sounds gross, it sounds unbelievable, but it's true. Because in combinatorics, these combinations raise via exponential scale. So that means that brute force combination to testing is not possible, that 100% coverage of testing is not possible either. And it also means that if someone tells you, I have great tests, they have 10,000 of combinations, it sounds awesome until you compare it with hundreds of billions of billions. Now, since the title is Hidden Art, I'll start with a brief questionnaire. Don't feel ashamed if you don't know, because the topics to this uh, questionnaire were selected, so that most of you probably wouldn't know. But if you do know, raise a hand and follow the plan. So, have you ever been told about test classes? About fair remote effect analysis, function hazard analysis, or fault tree analysis? You have? Good, good. Not so hidden for you. About dependency islands of equivalence classes. About state transition testing. About quality assurance maturity levels per baser and others. Excellent, we have one expert. About fault insertion testing. Or about fair remote testing. This may be just a fancy name for something you know, but still you haven't heard the term, right? Okay. 
how about uh, reflections? Have you ever truly reflected, like in-depth thought about the positives and negatives of random versus scenario-driven testing? Good one. About what's the difference between tester and test analyst or test architect? Nice. About the difference between verification and destructive testing? Two. Nice. Or code coverage versus path coverage. This one is should be basically familiar to at least some of the QA people. The reason why most of you probably didn't hear about this or reflected them is that quality assurance skills are slightly like an iceberg. There is something visible on the level of the sea, but most of it is hidden underneath. And this is a systematic problem which concerns the quality software quality assurance as a profession, because when you come in, you get just very low level intro. Even if you take the ISTQB foundation level training, which few people do nowadays, they teach you some useful techniques, yes, but many of the things are just like uh, terms and definitions, which are of course needed to understand anything further, but they don't push you that far. You would need to take advanced courses for that and who will pay for that. So you get just the beginnings, you are sent to work, learn by trial and error, and then there are many misconceptions, deeply rooted misconceptions. Mis misconceptions which we will talk about later, I will try to debunk at least some of them, but these misconceptions can essentially foil any deeper understanding because they will like, show you the wrong path to go. And then there are many cool distractions, for example automation. Everyone loves automation, managers especially love automation. But automation just means uh, do make the computer do something for you which you would otherwise do manually. It's not a substitute for testing. It enables efficient testing, but if you cannot test manually, you cannot automate it. That's like inherent to the, to the entire field. And combination of all these things make to get a low awareness, acceptance and usage of the advanced skills, because most people don't know that they are such skills. They no don't know why should they even try to pursue them, and they don't have time because they are distracted by other plethora of uh, possible things. So let's set the fundamentals straight, because uh, when I'm having chats with even, even quality assurance people, they often don't understand these basics. Tester, or per ISTQB terms, test technician, is someone who executes testing scenarios. Test automator is someone who automates the execution of those testing scenarios, and test manager is someone who plans the execution of those testing scenarios. Why am I bothering you with such boring stuff? Well, because the obvious question, which is however seldom asked, is where do those testing scenarios come from? Does the tester just suck them up from the air? Do they magically materialize? No, obviously. The answer is that they are created by someone called test analyst or test architect during a process called test analysis, which per ISTQB terms is activity that identifies test conditions by analyzing the test basis. Well, that's wonderful vocabulary definition, which probably didn't tell you much, now did it? So let's try to continue. So, with defining the difference between tester and test analyst, we can finally get to the first misconception. Often, I heard, even from some other teams, that we don't do test analysis, or we don't have time for test analysis. Well, sorry, you do actually do test analysis because that's just a name for something you do, maybe even without knowing it. To actually test something, that means execute tests, you first have to implement or write those tests. But to write those tests, you must understand what do you want to test and how. And answering those questions is precisely what test analysis is about. Now, the difference may be how much time and effort you spend on test analysis and what processes do you use on it? On one side of the scale is a dedicated team full of quality assurance engineers, test analysts, risk analysts, people like that, which has like two months of time to do proper test analysis. On the other hand, is a single guy who has just been told, hey, you, go and test that somehow. So while the first team does proper test analysis with many of the advanced techniques, the other extreme, the one guy, will do the test analysis uh, uh, 
subliminally while ha already hacking to the keyboard. He will start hacking some code for tests and in the process clarify what he wants to test and how. And obviously the difference is going to be quality and coverage of these things. Because if your test analysis is reduced to five seconds mental process, you cannot do much unless you are super genius. But then you probably wouldn't be working in software either, right? It would be mathematician in Los Alamos or working under a cold fusion. And so let's continue with the first real hidden secret of quality assurance. There are various maturity levels, which means like quality levels of quality. The first level is verification testing. That means that you just use the program as you think it should be used. You just demonstrate that it works somehow. That's what every developer does. That's part of debugging. You try to run what you just wrote, and if it fails, you slightly rewrite it, and then you run it again. Now, the problem is that verification testing is just positive. It doesn't try to break anything. It doesn't try to find the limits of the software. It just tries to po prove that it works somehow. When I was uh, still at school, one of the assignments at our programming exercises was to uh, wrote a checkerboard. And one of my co-students wrote a wonderful checkerboard. He was first in the class. And it works wonderful as long as he clicked on the upper left quadrant. So the teacher came over, he showed, he proved via verification testing that it works because if you clicked in the upper left quadrant, it worked just wonderful. It showed all dependencies where the figures can move, etc. And then the teacher asked, and what happens if you click at the lower right quadrant? So he did, and nothing happens because the code was faulty. And that's the limitation of verification testing, and that's why you don't want to remain stuck at verification testing. Because it proves that the basic minimum functionality of the program may work. It may work as long as the customer uses the exact same procedure as you did when you verificated that, and as long as the customer uses exactly the same testing data you did, and as long as he does everything just like you did, has your computer, your environment, your internet connection, and maybe even your username and password, you never know. So for that reason, verification testing is inher inherently limited. That doesn't mean that you don't need to do it. You do need to do it, because if you are just tested that your program doesn't uh, melt the reactor and break the earth, but you haven't tested that the program does the one thing it was supposed to do, it's not very successful software either. The second level is destructive testing. It's not uh, instead of verification testing, it's on top of it. So you do everything from the verification testing. You prove that the system works as advertised. You even try the industry standards, because for example, if you are making an application for XML transfers, and you know that it's going to be used by banking industry, in banking industry there are open standards for banking data exchange in XML. These standards define ugly data structures, and you probably should be able to pass them through your code, just to verify it works. Because they may be slightly complicated than the things you came on with your own, right? So in destructive testing you test everything that, and on top of that, you test boundary values. For those who don't know, that's for example that when your program is supposed to do something if variable a equals 1, you also test 0, 1, and 2, because it may be incorrectly implemented and those bounds may not be checked accurately. It's the simple case of uh, changing uh, greater than with greater or equal than, right? So that's boundary testing. You also test invalid inputs, something I like to call expect insane user. Because, you know, users will not only use the software the way you intend it to use, they will use it their own way. It's called hacking, using something for the purposes it wasn't designed for, yet it works. And it's not also a specification, so you cannot blame the user. Uh, you didn't use it the way we documented, you can only use it. No. So, for example, if there is a, f uh, a text box input, age, you are expecting the user to type in 21, like a numeral. Why couldn't the user write in the age, 8, as a word? You didn't say he cannot write age as a word, so you need to check for that. Expect insane user. All eight-year-old kid, you never know. You also need to test proper er error handling. The program can fail, every program can fail. But what happens when it fails? That's the question. Does it crash to desktop? 
create a blue screen of death, a bend, bring down the entire computer, or even short circuit, short circuit the whole city district, that's a difference, right? Well, instead it should throw some civilized error to let you know it's wrong and possibly even handle that. So proper error handling and messages, that's also important thing. And when we are speaking about it, the messages should also be accurate. When you type in eight as a word instead of as a numeral to the year or age input, you probably, mm, an error message which would say, mm, <laughs> invalid operating system, probably wouldn't be very helpful to you, right? It should instead say only numerals are allowed in this input. So not only proper error handling, but also proper error messages. And you also need to test data conversion. For example, when we are working on mainframe computers, they are using different uh, encodings than Windows. There is a lot of fun with that on its own, but one of the tricky things is that on mainframe, the character for tabulator, which you have on Windows, doesn't exist. So when you copy a data set from Windows to mainframe, and you have tabulators, for example, in the source code, on mainframe, those tabulator characters translate as invalid characters, and it can thwart some applications. So such a thing can occur, and in destructive testing, you also need to test those conversions. You need to test different uh, terminals or clients if you have a client-server application, because you are expecting user to use some client, but he may use other client. What if that different client sends some different message? Your application cannot intercept it, and not only it cannot intercept it, it can crash. That wouldn't look so great, right? Because, again, you probably didn't specify in the documentation you must not use any other client than I do, and if you did, the software wouldn't probably sell very well. Then we have third level. Again, it encompasses all of the previous, but on top of that, it uses some techniques, these are advanced techniques I like so much, which try to help you make sure that you have really tested the code throughout it that you didn't omit anything important, that you will not be ashamed when the product releases and customers start finding bugs. So how do you do that? You employ state transition testing and scenario-based tests, knowingly. You can try to use uh, something called S test classes, which was first defined in an IEA 29 standard, and I will talk about it more later, which is like a checklist and guideline to tell you what things to focus on and you have to test the product not on its own but also in the environment it can run on because it's amazing if your product can work in a vacuum but it will usually run on some environment on operating system and on some hardware and that creates an, a whole plethora of scenarios you need to test because your program can be perfect on its own but for example, what happens if your program needs to write some configuration file which it reads on each startup? And it starts writing that configuration file and while it's in the middle of this writing on config file, there is a power outage. The whole system shuts down in the middle. What happens when the system restarts and your program tries to read that half-finished config file? Does it crash? Will it be unable to ever run again? Will it need to delete the whole user profile with everything you had just to be able to recover? That's what can happen when you count in environment, so you need to test for that as well. What happens when your product connects to a database and the database is suddenly shut down? It can be. It can be a shared database amongst many users. Your program is not the only user who interacts with the database. Database can be shut down for maintenance or maybe just someone needed the system resources. So what happens if the database is shut down while you are processing it? Again, does your program crash? And or more importantly, if your program is presenting some important data, for example, a paycheck, and such a scenario occur, will it throw an appropriate error message or will it report damaged data? Because there are several classes of errors which are not all equal. Of course, there are errors which crash the entire system, so that's bad, you should avoid that. Then there are errors when the program doesn't crash, but it returns invalid results. And we have two extremes. On one end, there are invalid results so obvious that everyone knows that they are incorrect. 
Maybe they will be even caught by the program itself in the next step when it checks for the inputs and founds that an integer is suddenly several sextillion large. So that cannot possibly be an integer, so there was a fault through an error message. But what if the program computes a paycheck and you are supposed to get uh, $2,000 Yet the computation returns $2,005. And it keeps returning so for 40 years. And then the program is replaced by a new version or by competition, and it gets recalculated, and all of a sudden, you owe quite a lot of money to the company. So these subtle errors are the worst offenders, and you need to check what happens when the environment on which the program depends can possibly alter that. And finally, on the fourth level, we have preventive quality assurance. That's not so much about techniques anymore, it's more about processes. Because you need to expert deploy not only tools, but also people who know what they are doing, and you have to uh, have set up a processes in your company to enable them doing what they are doing. Because it's useless if you have the best risk analyst in the world, if you don't do any risk analysis. Then you take the risk analyst and say, hey, go make some tests somehow on level two, even though you have the people qualified for level four. So level four encompasses, for example, the failure mode and effect analysis, fault hazard analysis or similar, plus integrate something called integrity levels, which is pretty much doing an analysis what should be tested first, what could happen if the program fails and how serious that failure would be. It's usually organization-wide because you cannot really employ a risk analyst for a 10-person team. You just cannot pay the guy. So usually one risk analyst or some super advanced test analyst is employed for several teams or maybe whole small organization. So these are the maturity levels. Most of the teams in companies which don't know much about quality are on level 1 or level 2. A level 2 is pretty much as high as you can get on your own without anyone telling you how far you can go. But level three, that's where we all should aspire to go. And for level three, you need to know that these things exist, that you can pursue them, that you can learn them. Yet, as I said, it's a hidden secret, seldom taught. That's what I'm trying to change here. And finally, my favorite misconception. It's very popular, especially in companies doing Agile. I heard myself an Agile coach on Agile Breakfast teaching this. Anyone can do QA. QA is just a role you can put on, right? You can take a homeless person off the street and make him do QA. Well, yeah, partially yes. Because if you have testing scenarios and your homeless person knows how to click a mouse, then he can probably run those scenarios. But, but as he has shown, to create those testing scenarios. That's what quality is about. And no homeless person without the proper skill set can create those test analyzes and those test scenarios. So what skills does the QA engineer in the role of test analyst actually need to make you those uh, test cases or test scenarios which are worth it? For the first level, he needs to know boundary value analysis and equivalence partitioning. These are the basic techniques which tell the quality assurance engineer what inputs to even try. But that's the bare minimum. On the second level, he also needs to know data coupling, because otherwise he will run out of time as he tries to test several million test cases. He needs to do human operation error testing, that's the expect insane user tests. And he needs to check for error messages and do other things which are somewhat obvious if you know what you are doing. On the third level, which as I said is my favorite because every organization can achieve third level if they want to, if they provide resources, you need to know integrity levels, which is the table which decides how throughout you need to be with every input or output. You need to know about state transition testing, about fault insertion and fair remote, and about test classes. Test classes are something incredibly underestimated. When I found it in the IEE standard 829-2008, it literally changed my life as a quality assurance engineer. And I've seen it deployed to other people, it changed their QA metrics and really results as well. So we will get to that at the end because I don't want to bog you down with my favorite topic. And finally, for the fourth level, you need to know how to do uh, root, ca root case analysis when the defects from customers turn out. 
because you should reflect on those. In, in aerospace industry or automotive industry, it goes like this. An airplane crashes. So a team investigates the crash, finds out, except others, what was the root cause and what were the causes which like uh, facilitated the error. Maybe they wasn't just their fault, but they enabled the error to happen. And what happens then is that the whole aerospace or automotive industry does a feedback and actually inserts into their development process test cases designed specifically to prevent that kind of catastrophic error in the future. That's something the software quality assurance doesn't do at all. Not only because we are not so organized, not only because we are not bound by such regulatory constraints, but because we often have the attitude that it's not that much of a problem, right, if the software fails. Like, if a program crashes, usually 200 people don't die, unless your computer controls the airplane. But that's, that's changing because, as we are all in the industry, talking about modern software factories and uh, agile transformed society, industry 4.0, things like that, even software which isn't like intended for running mission critical application is starti starting to be run on mission critical applications. And one scenario when this backfired very ugly was the entertainment system in 2014 Jeep Grand Cherokee. You see people like smartphones today and they like apps and music and stuff, right? You do, right? So Jeep has put this wonderful entertainment system on their car it was possible to connect to it over the internet because cloud, right? And it was just an entertainment system. So there is no need to bother too much about testing, right? Like you don't want some obvious bugs which would shame you, but it's not like the car is going to crash if there is a bug in that either, right? Well, no. Because you see, this system was connected to the internet on one side, and on the other side, it was connected to something called uh, OBD bus. And OBD bus is something which connects pretty much all the important things in the car. So hackers found out that they can hack this information or infotainment system and through it they can access the car controls. They demonstrate it amongst others. For example, that the Jeep can be now stopped remotely on the highway. They cannot access the brakes directly to slam you on the brakes at 140 kilometers per hour, but they can issue a command to the car to emulate switching on the find parking space function. Find parking space function slows down to 20 kilometers per hour and starts scanning the right curb for a place to park. Well, guess what happens when that gets activated on highway? And the best thing is you cannot turn it on because the buttons are software defined. And when the software ceases listening to you, well, the, the, the journalist who was uh, testing all this was told to shut down the engine and start it over again, which to the older of ones brings the memory of the joke where uh, Bill Gates is riding a car and when it fails, he advises people just to enter and exit again, so maybe it will work then. But that brings us another problem. Fewer and fewer cars have the classic key to activate ignition. What if you have a keyless system? Then all these things are software defined as well. So the software, when it's hacked through the infotainment system, for example, can emulate you having your keyless card in there. And as much as you are try press that button, the software can keep emulating on, on, on. So there, there will be no escape. The car would become desperate. Why? Because someone thought that they don't have to secure or test infotainment system as much because it's just for fun, right? What can happen? And the problem is that you are now developing some system. That system might become a turnkey solution, which may be bought by another company. And then that other company will offer it to some other company which will integrate it in some mission critical system like car or heaven forbid even airplane. And now if you are developing software you may feel some chills if you imagine your software being used in a mission critical application if where some bug of your software can potentially kill people. So 
you need test analyst who knows what he's doing and you need good processes and QA maturity if possible at least level three but this anyone can do QA meme uh, also leads to one other ugly thing it raises a culture of QA being perceived of as low qualification job because you know if you're a developer you spend five years on university you know math you know algorithms you know databases you know maybe assembler you are just king of the creation well QA <laughs> well every homeless person can do that I am here teaching a quality assurance course like in the basic introductory course we have for everyone and it's also always mixed class QA pe future QA people and future developers and in each class I can really like no kidding see at least one or two developers going like <coughs> literally smiling and smirking like this is this is so like lame <laughs> QA stuff <laughs> but are people who know what they are doing are test analysts or test architects going to work in a company which uh, considers them ubermensch sorry untermensch hardly right so that can be a culture problem in a company as well so it's important not to think this anymore not to think that quality assurance engineers and developers are something interchangeable because they are both unique sets of skills and it's important to understand that especially fourth level test analyst is someone whose, whose skills are on the same level as a, as a quite good developer. So it's kind of insultive to say anyone can do your job because they really cannot. Anyone can do level one's job, maybe. Hidden secret number two, challenge all assumptions. There are principally three sources of defects in software. The first, that's coding errors. You intended to put semicolon on the end of the line and you didn't. Or you just made a typo. That's usually removed by computer-aided software engineering tools because nowadays you have those wonderful compilers which throw error pointing to the specific line where you made the error and it even says what you did wrong. So you compile code, compile code, compile code until the test passes. The the second source of defects is incorrect implementation. You thought you are doing it right, but, but you're actually not. The code is working itself, so the computer-aided software engineering tools cannot discover it, but your colleague with independent set of eyes can see that this if statement should have checked greater or equal, not only greater than. So that can be removed by code reviews. But the third source of errors accounts for 60% of all the errors in software code. Can anyone try to guess what is the third source of uh, errors in code? Please not you two, because you know the answer. <laughs> the source reason are incorrect assumptions or wrong understanding by the developers. See, developers are smart people. They know how to code. So they have sanitized all the problems they could have foreseen. They have implemented the code as robust as they could have. They have read through the specifications, made the image what needs to be done, and they did it, hopefully, flawlessly. But they are still only humans. We are subject to subjective interpretation. We read something one way when it was truly meant some other way. And developers are also often victim of cannot happen scenarios. How many times we have heard this? Ah, this cannot happen, so I will not sanitize it. One of the primary skills every quality assurance engineer has to have is to challenge those assumptions, because only black box quality assurance can discover those. Black box, because once you start reading the code, you accept the mindset of the developer, because he, implemented, he understood it some way, so he implemented it that way, and when you start reading his implementation, it subconsciously makes you accept his implementation. So you cannot discover an error. That's the reason why no one can code review his own code, and that's the reason why white box techniques are inherently limited. They can be very useful in making uh, subsequent uh, testing, especially equivalence partition-based testing, more efficient, but they not only cannot discover implementation errors and incorrect assumptions, 
they can also make you incapable of noticing them. Because once you read the code and you accept the developer's assumptions and implementation, you can hardly challenge it. It's, it's a conflicting set of uh, knowledge in your brain. So in black box QA, someone who doesn't know the code, who hasn't heard how the developer explained he will implement it, and who will instead independently review the inputs to functional specifications, if there are any, or other materials based on which these things are constructed. That can happen either, the testing itself can happen either in the QA phase when running the tests, or it can happen before in something called formal reviews. That was something introduced by IBM in 1960s or 70s, and it principally means that when the developers congregate in the room and start talking about their great ideas, they have some advocatus diavoli who is there with specifically assigned function, and he says, mm, that's nice, but what if this assumption isn't applicable? What happens if this happens? And by doing so, he can provide early feedback to the developers, which is the least costly. Because the later you discover error in the development cycle, the more costly it is. If you discover it in, on a formal review, somewhere in a meeting room, all it costs is five minutes of time of the developers and quality assurance guy. So that translates as few cents. But if you discover the error after the code is published and sent to the customer, you need to do root cause analysis what is wrong, you need to fix it, you need to run a regression testing, you need to write a problem document, you need to publish a fix, you need to validate it with the customer, and then you need to close the ticket, and you need to service that whole thing with your customer support guys. So that can be, I don't know, five man hours. Now, plus damages on your reputation. So now compare five minutes versus five hours, and it's immediately apparent why you want to catch bugs as early on as possible, ideally during reviews. But again, for reviews, you have to know, you have to have someone who knows what's he doing, not the homeless person of the street requalified as tester, but the test analyst with the uh, skills of fault tree analysis, functional hazard analysis, and stuff like that. And one of the important things here, which are even less like known, is that developers and the test analyst people, what they really need and what they usually have are completely different mindsets. Now, a psychologist named Malcolm Gladwell, I think, no, that was just the popular later. Well, it doesn't matter. Uh, a certain psychologist in 1980s discovered that there are essenti essentially two types of thinking. Convergent thinking means that you take many inputs and you work towards a single output. For example, mathematics, that's a perfect example of convergent thinking. You get an equation with five unknowns and you solve it to one correct solution. And that's the important thing. There is one correct solution to which you are trying to work. On the other extreme stands divergent thinking. Divergent thinking means that you get one input and then you try to make as many outputs as possible. It's like A and V. Now, a, f a favorite test for divergent thinking is that you are given one object, for example, a brick, an assignment. You have five minutes, make me a list of as many possible uses of brick as you can imagine. So everyone starts writing the obvious ones first, right? We can build a house. You can put it on something as a weight. But the people who have good divergent thinking can come up with maybe 30 possible uses of a brick, while the people who have not so strong divergent thinking maybe five or 10. And it does not mean that Convergently thinking people are stupid, on the contrary. For example, autistic people are often extremely convergent thinking. If you asked Albert Einstein, well, he was multiply gifted, he was a Renaissance man, so probably not him. If you asked Rayman to come up with as many cases for brick as you can, he would probably give you build a house, period. But if you ask the same guy to write some inc incredibly complex algorithm, he would probably do a wonderful job, better than any co divergently thinking guy. Because these are opposite extremes. They are complementary to each other. Each is suited for something better. Convergently thinking people are better for developers or test automators, where are trying to devise one correctly working solution as fast and efficiently and throughoutly as possible. And divergently thinking people are good for test analysts, because as a test analyst, you are trying to ask why, 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 or what, what, what. 
what could possibly go wrong? What if this happens? What if this? What if this? And the number of what ifs you can generate is somehow correlated to the quality of your test analysis. Of course, if you know the other techniques. So the lesson learned is challenge assumptions. It's even in the ISTQB foundation training. When, a d when you're a quality assurance guy and a developer goes to you and tells you, this cannot happen, you don't need to test this, ISTQB explicitly says, you do need to test that. Ignore the developer's assumption. And it's very important because some of these assumptions can be really harful, harmful. I have uh, an advanced QA coursework, which is actually like separate to this meeting where I try to teach people the techniques. And one of the favorite examples I use in there is a software glitch which killed over 200 people because developers have a simple assumption of what could not happen. Assumptions are really dangerous, guys. And it's not about people being stupid. It was uh, uh, in a flight software of Airbus 340. Uh, Developers are not stupid, they just have assumptions because they have some experience and their experience tells them that this doesn't usually happen. Well, that's nice, but try to convert that viewpoint to man hours. The developer has spent maybe 1000 man hours write mostly writing code and then some executing it. So there is maybe 200 uh, man hours executing that code. Now that the code is compiled, written, deployed and finished, shipped to the customers, 10,000 customers are going to use it for years. So suddenly you can have million man hours. And in, in risk analytics, there is something called mean time between failures. How often accidents happen? And it's usually deployed in, in thousands or millions of man hours. So when you're a developer, a failure with uh, MDFB of, I don't know, 1,000 hours, you probably wouldn't experience it during your lifetime. So your experience is, this cannot happen. But when it's, once, it's get it's, when the, once the code gets deployed, it starts to be used every day by thousands, tens of thousands of customers, it's maybe a matter of just three years be before the thing which cannot happen happens. It's a matter of statistics and risk analysis. So that's why. That's why you cannot trust the assumptions of developers. That's why you cannot trust actually assumptions of anyone because all of our assumptions are based on experience which is just too short to be of any use. Hidden secret number three, impact probability chart. One of the, one of the QA maximum is that there is never enough resources for QA. There is never enough time so that I could test everything I wanted to there is never enough time to do the test analysis as thoroughly as I'd like to. There is never time to automate it as well as I would want. Well, there is not time for anything, anytime, anyhow. So you have to prioritize. And how do you prioritize? Using 2D charts. Everyone loves charts, right? So you take probability that something will occur. That's our MTFB or some other metrics. You take the severity how bad it would be if something went wrong and you classify the functions and possible bugs or defects or failures accordingly. So, sun would explode, top severity, very low probability. User will forget his password. Well, very high probability, I don't know, is it high severity or low severity? If the password cannot be recovered, and the user loses all data, it's probably high probability and high severity. That was actually the case with Microsoft, who implemented uh, a user encryption in Windows XP. That encryption was linked to the user password, and the trouble was that when the pa pa user password was reset by anyone else than the user, for example by the system administrator, the encryption keys didn't match, and the encrypted data were forever lost. But on the other side, it occurs quite often to users that they forget passwords and come asking the system administrator, please reset it. I must know, I used to be a system administrator. So when that happened, all data was lost, and that's why this glorious feature, first of its type on Windows system, was called delayed deletion. 
because if you encrypted your data, it was just a matter of time because it, when it was deleted. High probability, high severity. What about hard drive failure? Well, it will happen, it's just a matter of time, so let's put it like here on the probability chart. And how large severity is it? If you have RAID 5, then probably low severity, because the data are mirrored. If you have just one hard drive, and the data are critical to running the application, or to paying your people, or to reserving your tickets, then it's high severity as well. So that's how you pick, and these things you test first. You test the high severity, how probabili high probability, that's the first. But what happens next? You've covered all those. Should you first test the possible fair use, which have high severity and low occurrence probability, or the ones which would have high probability and even low uh, severity? Well, the answer is you should test the ones with low probability and high severity. Because as we have just demonstrated, the, the, the man hours or working hours on the software when it's shipped to the customers, can grow, grow very fast. It can be a matter of years before the, c the software passes through the 10,000 working hours threshold. It can work for 30 years, you never know. I know it sounds stupid, especially nowadays, but there are still companies and offices which use DOS applications. It's been like 30 years now. So you cannot take the assumption, see, here it is, you cannot take the assumption that your program will be never used for longer than two years. Because what you know, you will get one customer who will just run it for 40. And if you made the incorrect assumption and tied something very important to it, then your software will crash and it will be even worse than if it crashed right after it was shipped. Because that customer has probably accumulated 40 years worth of production data. And if your bank just ruined 40 years of production data, that's not a nice cost to pay. And even worse, if you have some service level agreement with such a customer, it can ruin your company. High price for such a simple assumption, like how long can your program be used, right? Uh, yeah, but one thing is that be, ware, be aware that if you want to test the low probability, high severity scenarios, it can take quite a toll on your QA people. I've experienced it numerous times that I devised some nice test cases or test scenarios about those things. But the problem is, if it's, if it's really low probability and high severity event, it's actually hard to test it. Because to test it, you need to trigger it. But how do you trigger a hard drive failure? How do you trigger a mainframe computer hard reboot? when it has triple nine reliability, 99.999%. So to get around those limitations and artificially simulate the event, you have to invest quite a lot of resources and it's very simple to get consumed by that the way any developer gets to, co to writing his code and spend two weeks just on simple stupid s test case of low probability high severity event. You need to be aware of that, you need to prioritize properly and if you have good processes, for example, daily stand-up is very good for that. Y your colleagues should notify you, hey, like, I know this is important thing, but uh, it's already taking you two weeks. Maybe it's time to move on something else. Just a note from practice. Hidden secret number four. That's not so much as a secret as a consideration. There are people who just run, love random testing. There are people who hate it. The truth is, as it usually is, in between. Both have their weaknesses and strengths. So let's go through them. The random testing essentially means that you feed your system under test with random data. There are positives. The biggest positive is that you don't need to do any analysis. You don't need how to know how it works. You don't need to know uh, what is the function, what the customer wants. You just feed it with some data and it will give you some results. Completely black box and very simple because you can shorten down your test analysis phase pretty much to finding what are the allowed inputs. That's nice. But of course, it's also the source of the biggest problem. In testing, you need something called test oracle. That means something from which you devise the correct results. Because if you run a test 
and it does something, it gives you some results, and you cannot tell if the results are correct or incorrect, such test isn't of very use, right? And if you have random testing, you do not know in advance what are the correct results. You didn't do the computations, you're not expecting anything, you have no expected results. You have just actual results which got generated by the code. So there are, in principle, uh, three ways how to overcome that. There are, sorry, they are all listed in a British standard for software testing. So you can either have some trusted independent software, which already does the same thing, only maybe it, wants it needs to be replaced because it doesn't perform so well, or it's costly or something. So if you have some other software which already does the same thing, that means if you feed it the same inputs, it gets the data and you know that these data are correct, you can use that independent software to cross-check for the software you are now testing. And to tell you the truth, this is why many developers who have been told, hey you, go test it somehow love random based testing because if the solution of the test is not to bother with test analysis or testing activities at all but write some code generator which feeds random data and then have some parallel program which checks the results and against which you cross check it essentially means that you can write the same program the developers are writing in parallel and justify it as a feature for cross-checking the test results, right? So you can code and call it testing. Haha, <laughs> I got, <laughs> I got uh, away without actually testing. So that's essentially in today's world, where you have agile teams, where often developers are told to go testing, these guys will, more often than not, try to go with random testing because it enables them to code and call it testing. Of course, that brings slight problem. If the guys who are testing via coding the parallel software are in the same team as the developers developing it, they will probably have the same assumptions and the same understanding and implementation of the code. So of what use is such testing? It will, of course, discover incorrect implementation of the, of the tested code. It can test uh, some minor differences caused by different implementation between the tester coders and the developer coders. But it cannot test those 60% of defects which are based on incorrect implementation or wrong assumptions. So, yes, it's definitely better than nothing, but it has its inherent limitations. So the, the test oracle in form of parallel software was really meant as a software which already exists, not as a software you write for the purpose of testing it. Now, of course, there are exceptions. For example, if the, if the function of the primary software of the system under test is to sort some data, then it's uh, rather uh, simple to write a program which verifies that those data were really sorted. That's an exception to the rule. Then we have some other posi uh, positives. It can cr theoretically test many combinations of data. Uh, and that's very appealing to the management when the, when the QA people come and say, hey, we have our awesome random testing suite and it has just tested 10,000 combinations. Like, wow, that's something to report to the upper management, right? And it's all nice and shiny until you remember that even simple code with 70 branches has six trillions of possible code paths. And 10,000 compared to thousands of billions of billions doesn't really compare that well anymore, now does it? But the good thing is that it tests diverse values and not just a few static pre-selected. And that can be very important because uh, if you are doing scenario-based testing, as we will talk in a while, you pick some values based on analysis and you, analysis and you use the same values uh, on and on. The, these are the values on which the computation really depends, the gate variables which control the flow of the program. But there can be a glitch which you cannot discover this way. For example, imagine a program which is written like, if a variable is lesser than 1, do this. If a variable is larger than 10, do this. And the number can be a float, floating point number. 
So you test one, n boundary values, zero and two, or the least possible increment. You test the upper bound. But what if the number is, is in between? It shouldn't matter because it's, the w it's one equivalence class along with all others. But what if the code is implemented improperly and it can handle just numbers with one or two decimal spaces, but not with four? You don't know because your analysis will not show this problem unless you do code check and that messes with your head because you start accepting invalid uh, assumptions. But random testing can, by chance, trigger such a data. It can send there a number with five decimal points and the program will crash and you will see, aha, that's a problem which was not covered by the conscience test analysis based on equivalence classes and boundary values. So that's actually a good thing. Best approach would be to combine a conscious test analysis with some portion of random data testing generated on the basis of that analysis. But as I said, in QA you have never enough resources and you especially don't have resources to do proper test analysis and random testing. Yeah, the other thing are that it inherently doesn't trigger equivalence classes or cover boundary values except by chance. Again, the scenario when 1 and 9 are lower and upper bounds, you want to test one, 0, 1, 2, 8, 9, 10, but random tests will feed the values like 5, 7, 3. The random tests don't know what are the control variables, it doesn't know what are the control values. So hitting one of those important things which you absolutely do want to test is just a matter of chance. So you can say that unsupervised random data testing is somewhat like an evolution theory. If you give it several million years, it may catch the right stuff just by pure chance. But it's about luck. So to paraphrase Clint Eastwood's famous line, do you feel lucky? And the last limitation I want to talk about is that random data testing cannot text comple test complex activity. You feed it some inputs, you put it on go, but if, if uh, you want to test something multi-step, when you first bring the system under test to some specific state, and then you test what happens when in that state it receives some other inputs. Or if you want to do uh, fair remote testing or fault insertion testing, that's something random data testing just cannot provide in principle because it just cannot test this kind of scenarios because they are not based on just inputting some random data. So it's good to know all these things. Now a related concept to random data testing is live data testing. We can do it for example here. We have our production systems on mainframe when many people are running normal activity. It's not like on the customer side because people are coding there and debugging and restarting databases, all kinds of stuff. But it's a huge system. There are thousands of people on it and it creates quite some lively activity. And we have actually experienced here several years ago that we were testing one product and the team which was testing it chose the approach live system testing. So instead of random data they would generate, they let the code run on the system and write that parallel software to, to cross-check the results. But the strange thing is that the system actually caught a problem that no one here knew could possibly occur. Because uh, IBM's documentation on these systems, well, you have uh, hundreds of manuals and each manual is, uh, is between 700 and 1500 pages. So we have few gurus which have read through a lot of those manuals, but no single human can possibly encompass all that knowledge. So there will be always something you don't know. And one of those things happened on the system. And since nobody knew that it could possibly even happen, if w the team had chosen the scenario-based testing, it wouldn't hit that event. But since they chose live data testing and they were lucky enough that that event happened on the live system during their tests, they were able to catch it they were able to implement the changes to the code and they were even able to tell other, other teams, hey, this, this kind of event can actually happen, make sure you reinforce your code for it as well. So as I said, it's not a bad technique. It's just a matter of negatives and, and positives. You can have an environment in which random data testing or random driven testing will be the perfect technique for your purposes. I don't know, you must know your system.
the alternative approach is scenario-driven testing. It means that you use the advanced test analysis skills to determine the key inputs you need to feed your system under test. As I said, for the program which has 70 branches, to cover it all systematically, like 100% coverage, all combinations with all combinations, would take sextillions of test cases. So you need to reduce that number. And you do that by employing a wide variety of techniques to bring down the variables which you try just to the key ones, to the ones which actually affect something. That's called equivalence classes, and it means that all the variables which don't change the behavior of the code are considered to be in the same equivalence class. And you test that just once. You test each equivalence class just once. And majority of the test analysis effort is about finding the proper test classes, which can occur, sometimes brute force, sometimes by, uh, by skill, or experience, and sometimes by other analytical methods like uh, state transition testing and others. So that's how you analytically determine the inputs you want to test with. You run it with it, and since you have analytically deduced those uh, inputs, you also know what will be the outputs, because you can cross-check the inputs, which you know which are, with documentation. You can independently produce those results, and because you are not running tens of thousands of tests with random data, 90% of which is in the same equivalence class and thus useless or redundant. You can make those computations in advance, you know what are the expected results, and it's easy to, to check if the code is producing those expected results or not. So that's what I just described the first three green points. Uh, it is also the only way to test a complex or multi-step activity, because if, you, if, you, if your random data tests were even able to interface with the system under test to employ multi-step activity, which each step you add, the number of test cases affected rises exponentially. So even if the random data generator was able to interface in such a way and create multi-step activity, the chance, the statistical chance that it would trigger multi-step activity you should target decreases exponentially. So you need to test such activity, anything multi-step, analytically as well, and that encompasses not only fairly remote testing, or you try to make the system fail, and then you observe how it fails, if it fails properly and safely, but it also encompasses fault insertion testing. What is that? Well, imagine that you are receiving some, for example, packet from one system to another. You have assumption that packet was sent in such and such form and received in such and such form. Now, there is an evil dwarf somewhere over the network who damages the packet, so it's still delivered, but there is a fault in it. It's not correct, it's damaged. How does your system treat such packet? Does it treat it as a correct one and produce invalid data? Does it detect it? For example, we have some uh, circle redundancy, redundancy check and claim invalid packet send it again. These are the things which you test in default insertion testing. Or a different one. You are reading a data set from a hard drive. But the hard drive is an old one and it has faulty sectors. So, while you are reading it, you suddenly get some completely garbage data. What happens? Does uh, uh, stack overflow happens? Does your program correctly catch it? Fault insertion is what you need to test. Because otherwise, you would be assuming that all the data flowing in the system and to the system will never be damaged. And that assumption is just not realistic in the imperfect world we are living in. And you should also test uh, state transitions, because all the testing techniques you have been talking about are more or less concerned with linear execution of the code. But once you start adding objects, which can be set to some state and then another and then another, it can repeat, Linear testing is not necessarily the only thing you want to go, because what happens if your object alters between states A and B, and you test that if it re re uh, receives input 1 in the state A, and 2 in the state B, it's work, it works nice, but what happens if the states are opposite, if it re receives input 1 in state B, and input 2 in state A? Does it still work correctly, or does it crash? State transition testing, a different technique, analytical, but still something you can only do with scenario-driven testing. And now about the problems. 
As I said, the number of combinations you cover with scenario-driven testing is limited. It shouldn't matter because you're only selecting the, the combinations you really need, and you know it, you are consciously avoiding redundant test cases, but it means that if there is something which you didn't account for, something which your analysis did miss, and let me tell you that any analysis always misses something, you will not catch that. Uh, it also means that if the other team in your company uses uh, random driven testing and they report to management that we have just created 10,000 testing and tomorrow 20,000 testing and the management comes to you and says, well, how many testi tests did you have? 100 and tomorrow 110? Come on, make up some nice numbers. Because management are not uh, quality managers. They are normal managers and they don't know how to evaluate how much weight to put to such different numbers, right? So it's one of the things you encounter in the real world. That's actually one of the reasons why random data testing is sometimes favored, because people who are, us who are using it just look better, and they are able to push for their solution. Uh, it's also resource intensive. That means that in the random data testing, you just create a random generator, you create it once, and then you just let it run on the black box, which is the system under test. So you, you spend the effort once to create the testing data generator, and then you reuse it and reuse it, and it's pretty much possible to have one guy come to the company, write the random data, test data generator, teach some people how to use it, and then leave. It's one-time thing. On the other hand, with scenario-driven testing, you have to employ a specialist, a test analyst, to create specific test scenarios for each new system under test, for each new function, for each new feature. So you have to retain more people, more skilled people. But of course the results are, be are better, as I just said. And there is another thing which comes to the real world. The test analysis phase is, from the management view, a black hole. Because coders start coding, they are creating code. Code lines are increasing. The code can be executed, so they are doing something. And now the testers, they should test. That means execute them some test cases, right? Or at least write some test cases. So how many test cases have you written today or executed today? Zero, okay. Tomorrow, how many test cases have you written today? Still zero, what are you doing? Some document? We don't do documents, like start doing testing. We have limited time. These are all things which may sound stupid, but they happen in the real world. Because in real world, we work for profit. And profit doesn't get generated by sitting idly. So there is a pressure to do stuff. And when the managers don't know these interesting things, they are of course inclined to insist that you do something. So if you want this to work, that's why I said that uh, levels three and four are concerned not about only about testing techniques, but also processes. Because you have to explain to the managers that you actually need a test analysis phase longer than five seconds. You have to explain them the benefits so they can make the managerial decision to accept it or not, or to somehow adjust it so that it would uh, make sense as a, as a business reason. And thus, quality assurance processes get born and set, and that's what differentiates companies with bad QA from companies with good QA. Not only the people they have for the actual test analysis and testing, but also the managers, how they understand it, and how they embrace QA processes. And of course, this is different for every company, or maybe, maybe even every team. Because if it was the tester's way, I would be doing a test analysis even for a Hello World program. But spending two weeks on a Hello World program while a quality assurance heaven is uh, production hell, right? So that's where manager comes in, and the manager, with his uh, hopefully unbiased view, can decide how much resources does it make really sense to spend on the test analysis phase. So it's, it's a process where all sides need to help each other. The quality assurance people need to help the manager understand it, and the manager needs to help the quality assurance people get real. There we go again with my favorite iceberg picture. 
If you are new to quality assurance and you got some initial training, you hopefully know equivalence partitioning and boundary value analysis. I've mentioned these terms several times today, so maybe you got a glimpse. It, they also should know that they need to test for the human operator error or expect insane user tests. But these are some advanced things which are not typically taught to the newcomers to QA, but they are very important. Fa for insertion testing, I already told about. Fail remote is t testing means that when the program fails, how it fails. So these are also taught about. Dependency islands is a technique how to reduce the number of test cases. Imagine that you have uh, 10 inputs with uh, four variables each, or four equivalence classes each. Now, if you wanted to do 100% path coverage, that would mean multi multiplying the number of test cases in each input with all other inputs. So, 4 by 4 by 4 by 4. 4 on the power of 10. That's quite a lot of test cases, right? Using dependency islands means slicing these inputs so that just the inputs which are relevant for a single output are put together. So instead of uh, 4 by on the 10th power, you, for example, only have to test uh, 4 on the third power if just three inputs influence one output. And then suddenly, from unrealistic number like a sextillion, you can start getting to realistic number, like thousands or even hundreds, maybe even tens. State transition testing or stateful testing is something I talked about previously briefly. It's, it's uh, a field of expertise on its own. I'm only scratching the surface, but I'm nevertheless trying to implement portions of it. It just means bringing the system to some explicit state. Uh, because you're pretending that, th that the system under test or its features is a finite state machine. So you are trying to bring it to some state, you are sending it to different states, and you have expectations how it should behave accordingly and along the way. And environment, environment influence testing, that's what I was talking about when I was talking about the system restarts, the fair use, the power outages, things like that. And then we have uh, advanced, even more advanced techniques from the fourth level, like failure remote effect analysis, when you list the items or features, and then you go on and think through all the ways in which they can possibly fail. So, for example, if I have a car engine, it can fail because it doesn't have enough lubrication and oil, it can fail because the temperature is too high, etc., etc. And for each this fault point, you take it as a separate system, so you take the lubrication system and uh, coolant system, and you go on and you embark on all the things which can fail. You make nasty trees, nasty tables, but through these tables, you get to select what can possibly fail, how catastrophic it would have effects if it had failed, and what can be done to make it not fail, and what can be done to test that specific protection against fail. FEMEA is something which is often used in uh, aerospace and defense industry because your smartphone probably cash crashes two times a day and nobody minds, but if that huge multi-million dollar rocket or aer airplane which was just built crashed mi mid-air, someone would probably get fired at the very minimum, right? Or even people may die, so that would be even worse. So that's FEMEA is always done in such scenarios. And uh, fall hazard analysis and uh, fall tree analysis are different techniques which, which go a similar way. Fall tree analysis go takes first the, the some catastrophic event and then tries to list all the possible reasons which can lead to that event and even enumerate their probability so that you can probably place it on the severity probability chart. Now we get to Misconception number three, automation is panacea. As I said, everybody loves automation. Even I love automation. I wrote automating software myself. But since it's just a, such a buzzword, it often means it gets attention which doesn't deserve. And it also means that people are confusing apples with oranges. So see, when we are talking automation, there are actually two things. 
which you can be talking about. Either it can be automating tests which you have designed manually. So you do a normal test analysis and the output of the analy analysis are some test scenarios. And there are two things you can do with test scenarios. You can write them as a step-by-step -step humanly intelligible process to some Excel table. And then a tester or test technician comes and manually executes those things. That's how testing was done in the past. Or you can take that test scenario and implement it in Python or C Sharp or something else so that you don't have to execute it manually, it can be executed automatically. Point is that any way you do it, it's not a replacement for test analysis. It's just a different way of implementing the test cases once you have designed them. And that is a very good thing indeed, but it has also its shortcoming. Because sometimes it's actually faster to, to do manual testing than to try helplessly automate it. I experienced such, such a thing uh, quite recently, last month, when I was testing uh, a fault insertion scenario, actually, on our system. The database we are, we are working on has, has some logs. These logs are offloaded from production ones to archive logs, and the, and the utility I work on is able to verify that all the archive logs are really present. So what I needed to verify was to make, to insert a failure. To make one archived copy disappear. There was a relatively straightforward step manually. I just edited the, the information about the logs. But if I had wanted to automate that, it would take some serious overtime to feed all the necessary information about the archive logs and their time ranges and timestamps and stuff into the utility which I needed to use to remove it from the from the knowledge of the system. And I am I am using actually a, a test automate testing data automation tool which I wrote myself and which generates wonderful testing activity with everything. And I initially wanted to automate even this scenario because the, the things which my test generator produces are complete automated test cases so that I just make some minor modifications and I can use them as automated. But I soon realized that if I wanted to automate this advanced fault insertion scenario, it would take me maybe a day or two days. And by the time I should have been already finished with this testing because there was a deadline coming. So. Automation saves time, yes, but it's not always the best choice to pursue. You need to do cost-benefit analysis. And then there are there is the second type of automation. Then generators of uh, random inputs, which we talked about in the random testing. Uh, Computer-aided software engineering tools for example, there are tools on the market which you feed with some UML code and they generate the actual executable of code for you. Or here in CA, we have a wonderful product called uh, Agile Requirements Designer. And what is that is that you feed it with the model of the code and it generates automatically all the equivalence partitioning and boundary value based test cases for you. So it's good because it saves you quite a lot of time. It generates those thousands of test cases, which is very annoying work to do manually. And it makes it flawlessly. Because if you're writing 2,000 test cases as a human, chance is that you will make an error somewhere. The software generates this flawlessly. But even these things are limited in utility because you have to write the model of the code first, which is some serious overhead. The model has to be matching to the actual code, which is another overhead and possible source of, of defects. And it cannot uh, test anything, everything for you. It cannot be a replacement for test analysts because it still cannot test fault insertion scenarios. It cannot test fair remote scenarios. And above all, it cannot test the environment testing because the environment testing is based on knowledge of the people about the environment on which the system under test would run. And Agile Requirements Designer, as awesome as it is, cannot possibly know about all the environments all the customer could be running on or, or all the quirks which some uh, system administrator with 30 years of experience will get to know about the system. So it's, it's useful, it's a huge help, but it's not like panacea. It cannot solve all your issues. It can help you, but only to such and such extent. 
And third thing you can automate is something called twinkling. When I talk about equivalence classes, I said that you split the inputs so, just, so that just the inputs which would actually affect the result are grouped together and their combinations are tested. Now, to do this, you need to be absolutely sure that all the inputs you are testing are affecting the results and none of the inputs you have omitted from the testing is actually um, uh, affecting the results. Twinkling means that you run the same data with the inputs you know that should uh, affect the result and you try to feed random data into the other inputs and if you did everything correctly the output should not change because the other inputs should not matter when you feed them random numbers. So that's called twinkling. That's another thing for which automatic tools can help. So as I said, when you select the first scenario, when you automate the test cases themselves, it brings you some substantial execution settings because it runs automatically instead of guy with Excel doing manual commands. It ensures consistency of execution and reporting because the guy with Excel, when he's testing for eight hours a day, for two weeks, he is prone to make some error. Omit a step here, misrepresent an input here. It can make problems. And then he needs to verify, did, did I do something wrong or, or is the code actually buggy? And it creates some hassles. So with automation of the test cases, this is avoided. And together, these two positives enable regression testing. Because when you introduce changes to the code, you should not only test the new functionality, you should also verify that you didn't break anything which existed there before. So you need, ideally, to run all the previous tests. And when you are working on a product for a few years, you will have several hundreds, maybe thousands of tests, or even test case suites, and that means even more tests. To run all that each time you add a minor thing is a serious hassle. I actually, in this company, I lived through the transition from the old way of testing through some intermediary steps to, to the way we do it now. And I experienced products, both products which had automation of tests and which had not. The product which had not automated tests, we did regression testing once a year. We did it once a year because for the entire month, development was frozen and we were manually executing semi-automated scripts. If the scripts have been non-automated at all, it could have taken us months. Versus now, when the, when the tests are automated, you click it, and the only limiting factor is the actual capacity of the system to execute those tests. So it may execute for three days if you have hundreds of tests, but it's infinitely, no, not infinitely, but substantially less than if you did it manually. And the other positive is that for actually making such tests, you need less people. Because if you have manual tests, you have one test analyzed, which devises the test scenarios, and some four or five test technicians who just manually, like monkeys, take the Excel sheet and manually execute the steps. So one expert, five uh, low qualified guys. For if you have test automation, you can fire those slowly qualified manual testers or test technicians because you don't need them anymore. The automation does it for you, but it means that the one guy which remains has not only test analytic skills to create the testing scenarios, but also coding skills to automate them. And it brings us another problem. You have that convergent divergent thinking. For coding, you need convergent thinking. For test analysis, you need divergent thinking. So chance is that if your guy would be very good at test analysis, he wouldn't be so good at test automation. And even more, if he was reasonably good at both, if he, when he's switching, you can relatively easily switch to convergent thinking. Like, you know it all. You are reading a science fiction book one day, or, or painting a picture, or, I don't know, making a poet. And when you need to solve some math equation, your brain very quickly and flawlessly switches to convergent thinking, get the one result. But to to get into the divergent thinking, the what-if mentality, you need quite some transitional period. So if you have one guy for test automation and test analysis, it can make a problem because he will create some test scenario in divergent thinking. 
he will then switch to convergent thinking to implement it in Python or something. And when he switches back to divergent thinking to make the next test case, he will not be able to start working on it right now, or his, or his test analysis will be somewhat limited, because his brain would have to reshuffle for the divergent thinking again. So when one guy is doing both, it's good to, again, use processes to make sure that test analysis is done first, all the divergent thinking comes in one neat package, and, the, n and only then he's, he or she switches to the convergent thinking. It also usually needs, uh, means that you need actually more of those skilled people. Because previously you had one test analyst who was working full time on test analysis. And then you had those five testers who just executed those things. Now you have a test analyst who is also working on test automation. And test automation takes significant resources. It's not something you do so easily. So he cannot work on test analysis for 100% of his working hours because, I don't know, 60, 70, maybe even 80% of his working capacity is now consumed by test automation. So you need to hire five times as many test analysts or test analysts slash automator guys. So again, you can do the test uh, benefit analysis or you can hire a specialist to do the code, the test automation. That's also a solution and maybe the most efficient one. Uh, but also another negative is that except from the time to implementation, you cannot just automate it and be done. Trust me, several teams have tried this here. But as the code changes, the automation needs to be maintained. Without maintenance, it just fails. It fails because the tests get outdated. It fails because the database for the testing results got bogged. Or it just fails for any number of other reasons. So you need to actually find some time for maintenance. And that's also a problem in the real world. Because you are planning your development. And you are planning to make this new feature and test it. And, and solve this technical depth maybe. And, and make this new feature test it. And uh, by the time there will be already the deadline. Uh, would we be able to, to fit all that in there? Oh, and we should also do some maintenance? Sorry, not capacity for that. So the, the maintenance is a problem, and, and sometimes the, the organization solves that by having a dedicated team which does maintenance of all the test case suites. But this triggers another problem. Different test automation tools and frameworks are good for different teams. There is not one size fit all solution. And trust me, this has been already also tried here. A few years ago, there was one framework which was very successful with the management. And the management just came and said, hey, you will start using this framework because it's automation and that's good. We were complaining, being the bunch of conservatives we are, but we had to try it. So I started writing a test case suite in that Python framework. And in the middle of the development, I found out that Python as a language was incapable of doing some of the fault insertion tests I actually needed. So what did I do? I had to throw out two months of, sorry, two weeks of work in Python and start from scratch in a different framework on a different language. You should not force your people to use some automation framework just because it's standardized or because it's cool, or because everyone else is using it, or because uh, you are on the presentation from the guys who make it and they fed you schnitzels. Because you may do more harm than good. So that's also a consideration to make. And the last uh, negative is atrophy of knowledge and skills. I can tell you that <coughs> I've been on uh, database tools for five years. About three years ago, I implemented that uh, test data generator of mine. And it's an insanely powerful machine. It can, it can create many really advanced scenarios, including triggers and foreign keys and, and some special IBM DB2 things in a matter of seconds. But whereas five years ago, I knew exactly how to code different table space type, like uh, table controlled, subpartitioned, index control partitioned, UTS, now I don't know. Because for the, three, for the three years I have that old test generator of mine, I just go and I click a button and it makes it for me. And if I need something new, 
I study it, I research it, then I implement it in the test generator, and I never even bother learning it because the test generator will do it for me. Now, you may ask, what's the problem? Well, imagine that I was sent on a customer side, and the customer would have a strict policy forbidding me to bring my laptop and forbidding me to bring my precious test data generator on their systems because of some software policies then I will be helpless without my precious automation. So it has downsides. It's, it's positive and we will use it and I will continue improving it because the test data generator was able to bring down the time we need for creating test cases from half an hour or hour to just a matter of seconds. Sasha there can testify. He's, he's our SE guy and he, he uses it. But it has its adverse side as well. And you have, you have to un understand what the positives and negatives are, because for your particular scenario, who knows, maybe the negatives can outweigh the positives. So I can get to the last part of the presentation, which is about quality assurance in Agile and how to cope. So first we need to do a little historical insight. The first software development methodology, as it was in the beginning, was debugging. That was in the time where there were no specialists, there were just people doing the code who were often mathematicians. So it was pure improvisation. You wrote the code, you tried to execute it. If it seemed to work, you call it done and you started working on the next. If you, if you remember the test maturity, that's even less than the first level, the verification testing. Because in verification testing, you try at least several different successful execution paths. You try at least some other inputs. In this input, you, you often only try the one thing you try to do, and if it seemed to work, then it worked. Uh, it was one big prototype, because it was never throughout the engineered, architecture, architected, and it didn't have any QA. There were no QA people in 1950s and early 1960s. Quality assurance just didn't exist as a profession. There were people considering it in other industries than, than software, which didn't exist as an industry entirely back then, but they were rejected in America. So what did they do? They went to Japan, and the Japanese goods after, f after the Second World War were a synonym for, for junk. And these this American guys came to Japan and started teaching them quality assurance methodologies, things we, which we would call test analysis, things which we would call like frequency, analysis, risk analysis, even the fault read analysis. And within a few years, the, Japanese, the quality of Japanese goods has improved rather a lot, so then the American companies started hiring the same few guys they rejected 10 years ago and started inviting them for a huge money saying, hey, teach us the same QA things you learned those Japanese guys, maybe you can get the on the same level. But there was no QA at software at that time. So the problem was not discovered during development, so it was discovered by the customer. But the customer didn't have really high expectations because he never encountered a working software or flawlessly working software. So what happened was there was a <laughs> very fast loop. The customer took a phone, called the developer and said, hey, this doesn't work. And the developer came and said, okay, uh -huh, this seems to be the problem. And he just hacked in a solution. And why, when I mean hacked in, it was often in the literal sense. There were buttons on the computers which represented the memory and you were able to shift them and alter the operating memory in real time. And that's how the first bugs were fixed. In real time, in the memory, temporarily. If the system shut down, the memory got wiped out, you can start from the beginning. And that's the difference on in mainframe world between temporary fix and permanent fix, by the way. So this was, was without verification, without vali vali validation, and very low quality, and no QA people. When software started evolving, it started to be more and more important for huge companies, and also for the United States Department of Defense and British Department of Defense, these two military organizations were the pioneers of quality in software in Western world. Because, you know, when you are planning for the Third World War, you cannot really afford rockets which fail to fly or fail to ignite. That's not really good for, you know, mutual assured destruction when you are trying to intimidate the other party to not trying to attack you because it would end up well. 
Missiles which don't fly are not in intimidating, sorry. So they created a methodology which was called waterfall. At the beginning, you create it and gather all the requirements, and you put together some impressive documents. And then everything you did was built on those documents. Of course, there were problems, because as we just said, 60% of the defects in software come from misunderstanding of the requirements. So this was somewhat fixed by the Institute of Formal Reviews, which was introduced in 1970s. But then there were two other problems and bigger ones. The testing was at the end, so if the coding or implementation got longer, there was often very little time for testing, so the projects were rarely developed on schedule. It wa they were somewhere sometimes under-tested, they were almost always late, and horribly over budget. And then there was one other problem. In the Department of Defense, there is something called capability creep. It's because in defense, it's a state-run business. And if you are trying to make anything new, you have to get finances approved for it. So you go to Congress, you propose some project, and hopefully, maybe, after a few years of infighting, it gets approved. So you start developing the project, which was approved and financed, funded, and then the generals come and say, hey, this is a nice project. It can already do N, and it's funded. Say, cannot it also do N plus one? Because it's funded. This is called capability creep. They always wanted to stack more functionality into the project which was already funded. But of course, it couldn't be done because it was all based on the specifications and analysis which was done 10 years ago when the original document was created. And sometimes it was not uh, capability creep on its own, it was just that after 10 years the operating environment has changed so profoundly that if the project was uh, delivered as originally planned it would be of little utility. So it had to be redesigned, but if you are redesigning something at the very end, because this is where validation that you are get shipping the right product happens after 10 years, there is only so much you can do. So what happened? A few guys came together, embarked on a manifesto which was written, and came with something called Agile Scrum. Agile Scrum is very customer-centric, the validation happens all the time, and it embraces design changes. You can come almost any time and say, hey, you started developed developing a locomotive, but now I need a plane. Put some wings on it and make it fly. That's a good thing in Agile. It's, it's bait for that. It has also very short release times, because you are not shipping one huge missile, you are shipping one component at the time, but in such a form that you can demo it to the customer. So that the customer can, can feel and touch it if he is getting the thing which he really wanted, or if the design team has understood the requirements incorrectly. So how it works? You start by taking a look at the requirements and analyzing how to do it. When you have some idea, you start coding it. You code ideally a prototype, you show it to the customer, is this what you wanted? Yes or no? If no, then you code again. Did I get it correctly this time? Great, we can proceed. So you have these short iterations called sprints, and you first groom it, then you code it, and then you test it. And by testing it, I mean executing the tests, because in Agile, the tests are supposed to be created at the same time the code is being created. And we will get to where this leads in a short while. That's QA end of parallelization. The problem is that as it rejected Waterfall with its documents and annoying analysis stuff, there was little time for analysis left. The whole time you have for analysis is this phase, which, when you enter the spirals, the iterations, starts here. So you test, you finish testing the code, and in the time which is left in the sprint, you are supposed to groom next, or do it parallel to your work. People today would have you believe that there are just those two methodologies, waterfall or agile. And since waterfall is stupid, Agile is the solution. Well, that's not entirely the truth. There is a mixed, there are a few mixed methodologies made by the departments of defense, 
because they didn't feel that such a short time for analysis are enough. So one of them is something called Spiro. It looks like Agile, but it's not. It's actually an ugly mutant. Why it's ugly mutant? Well, it goes in iterations, but each iteration is not a new feature being delivered, but an expansion of the one feature being delivered. So this spiral is actually the waterfall process just spiralized. But there is one profound change. While in waterfall, the feedback was at the very end, here the feedback is in this phase because you start building non-functional prototypes. You cannot build a working car in two weeks, but you can make a wooden replica of the car so you can see how it is large, how you can park it, maybe even sit inside and see how much space you would have. So that's prototype. It's also very much uh, focused on selecting or evaluating the alternatives because you did it some way, but maybe it can be done a different way, and maybe the different way can be better. So let's let's try it. Let's let's consider all those things. So that's what happens in this quadrant. You build the prototype, you analyze all the risks, so there is time for risk analysis, it's specifically designed so, and you also consider all the alternatives. Because in this phase, selecting, hmm, okay, Maybe maybe when we want to make a locomotive which can fly, maybe wings aren't the best idea. Maybe, maybe we can put uh, rocket engines on it. Maybe that would be more reliable. And that's a f something you want to try here, not, not there when you have working prototype. And then you try it. In the first spiral, you do just emulations. You simulate it somehow, just to, just to see if it would work or fail completely. In the second spiral, after you create the requirements and plan and final non-functional prototype, you start making models, which can move things, they don't work on their own, but you can already see what works and what does not. Then you make the actual design, including the design specifications from Agile. The in Agile, it's sorry, from Waterfall. In Waterfall, this was happening in the beginning. Here, this is happening only after the design was truly feedback with the customer and it can be made sure that the customer is actually getting what he wanted. So that's the huge improvement over waterfall. And then you have a dedicated integration and test plan phase when you do the test analysis and everything else and you have plenty of time for it. Then you build operational prototype and then you start doing detailed finalized code, not the prototype code, but final code, unit tests, and you start running the tests because the tests were designed here and implemented over there while the while the developers or engineers were busy making the operational prototype and then you just accept it and implement it so that's how it works in spiral so it was used for the on the super Horn, boeing super hornet fighter and it was the first fighter jet which was developed on time and on schedule after 60 years so that some says something but as it's agile only made in a spiral and with more feedback, it means it's still slow. On Super Hornet, it typically takes one or two years for each spiral phase to finish. So it's good for Department of Defense because they can wait two years. They prefer two years waiting time to the product which would be failing or of uh, not enough quality. But in commercial world, you cannot really afford two years release cycle. You never could have afforded two years release cycle. One year was most, and now even that is not enough. Then there is even one more methodology, and that's V-model. It also addresses the problem of waterfall, where, where the actual needs of the customer are misunderstood, and it does so by introducing feedback at every level. So you first do the normal system analysis and the requirements analysis, and you communicate it directly to the customer. Based on this analysis, you already start creating integration test plans and test cases. Then you define the requirements for the system and you compare them against what was created previously. You, you go and verify, is this really how you wanted it? And if so, you proceed further and you start making system tests based on this. 
So the test phase is not shifted to the beginning of the water, to the end of the waterfall, it begins at the same time as coding. Or more precisely, the test analysis phase takes time at the same point when the code analysis is being done. So it's not out of sync. Analysis for testing and coding goes this in at the same time, and implementation of code and tests goes at the same time. Then this happens on lower levels. Finally, you start writing the code. And because you started with test analysis and it's already done, and you even implemented your tests at the same time when the code was being implemented, you can test it right away. So you verify it, and if it passes, you push it up, and you validate it across the requirements and the tests you made at this phase, etc., etc. This is approach which is used for the highest quality systems. If you want to develop a nuclear power plant control system or a space system, you use this. At the first phase, it's explicitly required that you do functional hazard analysis, failure mode effect analysis, test analysis, and stuff like that. And that's why this approach, the V model, is being used by the Department of De Defense, NASA, etc. Because you don't want to rush your software to Mars only to sentence your astronauts to death, right? So, knowing all this boring stuff, we can finally move on to the last point. Ideal QA world would have V-model or Spiral. It would have a dedicated QA unit, like uh, a team of teams, which would have full-time test analysts, risk or reliability analysts, and other people like that. It would have test managers who would understand everything they are talking about. It would have dedicated team of test automators, so the test analysts can really focus on their job. And it would have a team of testers who would either execute the, the manual tests or in interpret the results of the automated tests, maintain them, etc. It would have clear specifications, because that's one very important concept in QA. You must not have ambiguity. I will talk about that more in the slide on Agile and the challenges and solutions. But uh, suffice to say now that in this like high quality software development and quality assurance, you have the system requirement specifications, detail design specification, function specification document, and these are the documents from which the quality assurance engineers are actually taking all their inputs. That's what they cross-check the code about. That's what they cross-check the code against invalid assumptions and wrong implementation. But it takes months to deliver something functional, so it's very slow. And that also means that it's there is time for all these quality assurance things. This is the idle QA process. And to do achieve all that, it would also mean that there are standardized, well-engineered processes used made by IEE, ISO, IC, uh, IC, and other organizations. Now, in commercial software business, we have to move somewhat faster. So we use those short sprints. What are the results? For one, we have very small teams. For example, in my team, there are about nine guys, two QAs, or three now. So you don't have a dedicated test analyst. You don't have dedicated test technician. You don't have dedicated test automator. You have two quality assurance engineers who have to have the skills to do that all. And they have to prioritize to stop doing test analysis at the right time so they can still finish the test automation and test execution, ideally by the end of the sprint, if, it, if that's not possible, which is often not with enterprise software, then by the end of the product increment. Specifications. That's where the huge problem lies, or a huge challenge, let's call it, because it's a challenge which can and must be overcome. Instead of huge documents full of specifications which tell you everything you need, you get stories. Story says, as, as a user, I want to send and receive emails. And based on that, the developer is supposed to implement that and quality assurance is supposed to test that. Now, a problem is that this type of specification is the exact example of what just five years ago ISTQB used as a negative example how it should not look. Because such a definition, as a user I want to send and receive emails, creates far more questions than it addresses. It creates ambiguity, where you don't know what is the correct result, because it's not specified anywhere. For example, should the emails 
be able to also use attachments. What file type of attachments? All? Should it not accept executable files? How large attachments? What is the limit? If an incoming email with attachment exceeds that limit, should it be accepted or rejected? Or should it be stripped of the attachment and delivered as the, as the remaining text? What encodings should it work or support? If someone en sends an email with a different encoding, should it be automatically converted? Or should it be delivered at the original format? Things like that are what you base your tests on. Because you need to be able to answer all those questions to see if the developers have implemented it correctly. Without those answers, you cannot test because you don't know what the expected result is. The, the system you test rejects an email with attachment. Was it correct behavior? I don't know, it wasn't specified anywhere. So how do you overcome this? You have to ask the product owner or customer. And you, as a quality assurance engineer, in Agile, you actually have to do the work which was previously done by uh, system analysts or system requirements analysts. You need to create, actually, the functional specifications of the product, which will answer all these pesky questions. And because no one else will, will make it for you, you have to get them from the customer or from the product owner who represents the customer. Now, that makes another problem. You are on a very tight schedule. Ideally, you are supposed to start making executable tests at the same point where the developers start coding. But as we have explained in the beginning, to start making executable tests, to implement that, you already have to have your test analysis finished, because otherwise you don't know what to implement. So your entire test analysis should fit here. For developers, that's somewhat easy, because the developers are finished coding here, and they can dedicate all this remaining time to grooming or analyzing the next feature to be implemented. But for you, at that phase, the actual work begins. You start executing the test cases you've implemented, and you are done not here, usually not here, and sometimes not even here. So there is very little time for the test analysis. But as we have just said in the whole presentation, you cannot have quality without proper test analysis. So how do you do it? How do you do it? And there are several solutions to that. You can, for example, if you have at least two quality assurance engineers, split the work into basic and advanced testing. The, the wh one guy who is doing the basic tests starts actually coding the basic tests along with the developers, because the basic tests are very quickly like decided. The other guy makes the test analysis, so when the test analysis finishes here, there are already enough basic tests coded, which can be executed later on, and the advanced test cases, the remainder to the full test analysis, is being uh, is can be started implemented. And then it's, it's it runs in parallel, the basic tests and advanced tests. Basic tests are executing, while the advanced tests are still being coded. And uh, by here, the basic tests are finished, and the advanced tests are executed, and hopefully, hopefully, it can all finish on time. If you are quick enough with your test analysis, if you didn't receive any substantial problems with the code, which you had to retest, and if your test analysis was quick enough to happen in the time you had. Alternative solution. You can have a full-time test analyst or a test architect who works for several teams and does the test analysis for them while the QA engineers in the team are busy automating and testing. Also a viable solution, but it has its but. Such a shared test architect or test analyst needs to understand all the products of all the teams he's working with. So that's some substantial extra knowledge he needs to have. And there may be other, other approaches to this, but there is no, not one correct approach. Whatever works for you is a correct approach for this. And the last thing, in, in Agile, we all had to adapt. Agile itself is a very shape-shifting uh, set of processes, or it's not so much about processes as about uh, priorities. 
So we are all learning on the go and we are all implementing it our way. You are put to the thing that you need to do four week sprints or then two week sprints and how you cope with it is your responsibility. So you do your best and you do what works for your team. But during that, as you are trying desperately to accommodate to the changes and, and fully support this, because it's the future, you have to do it, because even if you didn't want to do it, the competition would force you. IBM was recently forced to switch to Agile because everyone else was switching to Agile and they would look, they would look stupid if they didn't. It, it's how it works. It's like an avalanche. If everybody starts using Agile, customers start expecting rapid delivery. There are actually articles in IT that uh, uh, one of them is called how Apple and Google ruined IT software development for the rest of us. And the logic was like, uh, when customers started receiving frequent updates to their smartphones with new features every month, they realized that, uh, okay, frequent updates or upgrades are possible. They can be small, but they are frequent. And they learned not to worry about bugs because, okay, they said, my smartphone crashes every day, but I get the new smileys at the end of the month. That's worth it. So you had to adjust and you have to find a way how to adjust. And why I'm talking about it, processes. A lot of time, people in Agile are saying that they don't have testing processes because it was like processes are something evil, a stigma. You know, when you're using processes, it means documentation, it bogs you down, it makes you unflexible, it makes you non-agile. Well, that's actually not the case because right here I have the Agile Manifesto. It says individuals and interactions over processes and tools, but it does not say instead. It says over. They have come to value it over but not instead. That means that processes still have their intrinsic value. And it's obvious if you think about what process is. A process is any way you do to achieve something. So even if you think you don't have any processes, you do. You just don't call them processes. Once you admit that you have a process, you can use a different word if you want. You have pineapples. Then you can start adjusting those processes to squeeze as much quality as you can in the time you can. Because after all, in even in Agile, it's not a revolution. Remember, for quality assurance, there is never enough resources. So in Agile, you just have to squeeze somewhat less resources. It's essentially the same paradigm, just different variables. So it can be done. Each team is doing it differently. It may be challenging. But, hey, challenges are there to be overcome. In IEE standard for software documentation, which is otherwise a very boring read, I came across a word which was very, like, interesting to me because I didn't hear it any time before. It was test classes. And there was a brief example what those test classes are, and it listed several like hints of what to test, several areas what to test. So I, I came to develop on that example, and I found out rather soon that test classes can actually be my guide for what to test, because it's, it's like a cheat sheet. Hey, don't forget about this one, a guide Okay, and, and this test, I want to test this. Where does it belong? Haven't I tested it already? Ah, it's here. Okay. It's in front of me still. And checklist, because when you have finished it, you see instantly how much of the things that are important you have covered and which things are not even applicable. The, the, the various maturity levels and techniques I talked about previously, they are all wrapped in the test classes because the test classes inherently hint, you should do this, you should do this. So you either do it or you say, no, that's not applicable for this feature. And several other, other QA engineers have become using the test classes. They have started using the te template I made because the important thing is that test classes are not something fixed in the stone. It's, it's a general concept. And it's a concept which, if you have some understanding of the things you are doing, you can quickly adjust to your organization, to your team, to your field of work. But once you create such an adjustment for your team, it can become, you can just uh, copy the template each time and just populate it for the feature we are now working on. That's how we are doing it. So we have one template for our DB2 tools team 
and I have created another more general template, which is supposed just to give you, in give you inspiration how it can look, what you can remove from it, what you can add, whatever applicable. As I said, there are many templates, or there could be. I, I have a feeling that maybe I have somewhat coined uh, something that I didn't like entirely intend with the test classes, because in their documentation it's just a very a very brief note, and in their in their like take the test classes are supposed to be only part of the test plan, which is something nobody does today. If you hear someone saying I made a test plan, what they actually mean is I made uh, high-level test cases. So that's something entirely different animal. But anyway, let's let's see in the example. Here I've taken the liberty to to show the test classes template I made, just to go with you rather quickly what it covers. So it has headers like the first header. It's a multi-level list. You can download the the template. I will give you the the link if you want, guys. Uh, the first is just some positive tests. First thing you do is basic sm sanity tests or smoke tests, because when someone makes changes you want to see the very instant if it's really at even worth doing more tests because if the program is supposed to count 1 plus 1 and it fails to do that there is really no reason testing what happens when you feed the program with minus infinity, right? So basic smoke tests. Then inputs which should be included in output successfully. That means for example that when we are filtering on the letter A it includes Abe and uh, Amy and that's it. And also some industry standard, for example, at the banking it change XML. Then you have negative tests. That doesn't mean destructive testing. That means things which should not be included in the outputs. So that means when we are filtering a list of names for A, you should get Amy and Abe. That should be there. But you should not get Dave, because Dave does not begin with an A. False positives, false negatives. In this, you should also do the fair remote tests or how the program handles errors, if it shows the appropriate error messages, and if it's justified by the integrity levels. That was the 2D table, the integrity, uh, sorry, the severity probability chart. Whether you should implement failsafe, because uh, safety engineering is not that much part of software engineering or what developers would do. In the real world, it would often be done by a completely dedicated field called reliability engineers. So that's something you, as quality assurance engineer, can do, and the developers would rarely do it. So it has happened several times throughout my career that I, I decided on the integrity uh, scheme that our product or, or the feature we are developing should include fail-safe, uh, handling and I had to convince the developers that they should like actually made it in the code. What means say fail safe? It means that if your program fails it doesn't damage anything important by the way. So for example if your program is working with some production database and it fails, it crashes, it doesn't destroy the database. Things like that. It instead needs to crash in such a way, in such a controlled way that it wouldn't damage anything important. That's, that's fail safe. So if you decide that failsafe should be applicable, here is where you test it. So it's always a reminder. Usually it's not, but sometimes it can be. Then you have immediately following advanced tests. You are splitting them because these require more analytics, more effort, and while the basic tests are very quick to discover, and you can st your, your colleague can start working on them as developers are in Agile, these are the things which will follow later on. So, a typical uh, uh, activity. When users are using the program as a hack to accomplish something else that you intended, but the program is useful for it anyway. Things like incident recovery or in databases rollbacks. When something bad happened, but it was handled by the software, and you encounter it, how do you handle it? Are, uh, is your program able to survive that? Then you have advanced or atypical objects. Uh, rare parameters, for example, when, when in XML you can have some inline schemes or wild encodings, C data, C data in XML. That's exactly what I'm talking about. It's, it's not so advanced, but it's, not, but it's also something many people will not include in their testing. And I will tell you a secret now. IBM claims that they have complete support of XML, except they don't support C data very well. So, 
that's something we have tested, found it's failing, and found, ah, it's limited support on IBM side. Well, or if you are creating some database objects, often these objects can have wild parameters and very like uh, rare combinations, which completely change the way they are processed. So that's also the things you are doing here. For example, to tables, you can you can associate clone tables. You can associate history tables, which like signify the all the changes which were done to the table. Things like that, and your product may encounter it. And if you forget about testing those objects, which can occur on production systems, you can be in trouble, because you you assume that you didn't you the developer assumed that he would not encounter such objects, but that was an invalid assumption, which you as a quality assurance engineer should have caught. Then you have the environment to set things, the advanced or atypical system states. So that's exactly the fourth insertion. For example, if the data are corrupted on the fly, if the system restarts at during your program's execution, things like this. And also the ones in nevermind scenarios. That's the low probability and potentially high severity incidents, like your leap year, your, your product handles date and salaries. How does it compensate for your leap years? The famous 2K, some problems did have problems with it. Database lock rotation. All the timestamps change and suddenly uh, fresh data are having lower timestamps or identifiers that, uh, than old data. How does your program handle that? So these things you should also test for. Then you have uh, a list specific for the equivalence partitioning. This is what could be generated by the utilities, by the case utilities like the CA uh, Agile Recommended Designer. And also part of them is load limits tests. Because whatever your program is processing, it will have some maximum capacity. If it's a text editor, how long text can it process? What happens if you exceed the test while writing it? What happens if you exceed it that length when opening a text file? If you are pro doing something like dynamically, that you are increasing the, the storage for the objects, then what happens when you exceed the allocated memory which your pr process is allowed? Overflow? Crash to desktop? What happens? Or is it safely handled? Then you test the input tests, the human operator errors, and character conversion handling. Again, uh, an example on IBM mainframes, we have several code pages, and these code pages ha map some of the some important symbols on different places. So, for example, when you have square brackets in one encoding, it's square bracket. In another encoding, it's some euro sign. Now, square brackets is something which uh, occurs quite a lot in, for example, source code. And when suddenly a different encoding returns, it's got all messed up. That that's what happened when we were testing XML support. We sent out a code which had square bracket. But IBM implicitly converts everything to a different encoding which had a nonsense character in that place. So it messed up our code which was trying to insert C data section. Character conversion. Don't forget about it. And the output tests. And by output tests, I don't mean the correctness of the data because that you already covered in the basic and advanced tests. Here I mean the formatting, paging, things like that. It's it's more of relevance in banking applications and things like that, but it can even incorporate such a thing that where you are generating a PDF document, you don't, for example, print HTML tags or some internal tags as a as a visible text. It also the here you should also test the messages and code shown to the user, which are not error codes. So, for example, warning, informational messages and also correct handling of the data sets. Because it's nice that your product works like a charm, but if it opens some important file as read-only, and it remains read-only even when you close the program, and then you cannot access it from anything, it's not a nice behavior. It's something I experienced actually on Windows 95. So it can happen. And of course, databases interaction. Again, not the payload but that you are working with it correctly, you can approach it correctly, you don't fill the database with error code because you are sending errors, SQL statements, and such and such. And finally, these are things which almost nobody thought about, 
but there are actually standards and regulations to many of our activities and maybe that your product needs to comply with it. It's not just the World Wide Web Consortium standards like XML, which can be liberally uh, being non-conformed to, but you have European Union regulations and there is just about 100,000 of those. So if you breach those regulations, you are subject to fines, or the company which is using your program is subject to fines. And then you will be subject to fines because you delivered them a program which is non-conformant. So you need to check if regulations are applicable, and if yes, test that as well. The regulations that have their own testing processes defined, so you just copy-paste those. Uh, and also you should test, if applicable, interaction with, which, with utilities which could affect your program. So if you are handling databases, that means reorg. If you are handling files on desktop, that means defragmentation, stuff like that. Then you have your typical front-end testing, system integration, if applicable, which is not the same as environment. Here is really about integration with the system. And f finally, performance tests, because if everything else passes, it's okay. But if you run performance tests and your program is suddenly, the new feature you delivered suddenly comes with 20% performance penalty, you probably don't want to ship that to the customers. Uh, again, it's actually something which we have experienced. We have, uh, we have delivered a feature which was supposed to increase performance, but uh, we had no performance tests. So I quickly created some automated performance tests, we ran them, and the performance was suddenly worse. So it was immediately put on the hold, it was not released to the customer, and we is investigated, and hmm, battery is out, sorry guys. And, and I I eventually we found that there was a parameter, and on our like testing systems, this parameter cannot be set to a high enough value, but on customer side, they can, can set it to such a higher value, and the higher this value was, the, the better the code would be performing. So we did some approximations, and we found out that the actually the, improves, Im the performance would improve if above some threshold. So we shipped it to the customer with a note. If you cannot afford this, this threshold, don't use the new code path. So that was all. I am sorry for extremely long presentation. Thank you for bearing with me, guys.